<laughs> yo, 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 yo. What's up, everybody? My name is Juwan Rohan. This is the Misguided Podcast. We intend to guide you to a better future. I'm sitting here with Philip Carrillo, uh, entrepreneur, finance, Airbnb, Tarot. He does it all. I'll let him explain. How you doing today, my brother? I'm good. I'm good, man. Uh, yeah, like you're saying, my name is Philip Carrillo. I'm based in Atlanta, Georgia. Currently, we're talking about mistakes on this podcast. A mistake of mine was not understanding what time zone I was going to be in when we were shooting this podcast. So I thought I had an hour to go shower and do stuff. But regardless, we get things done. Uh, my background is, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, no, I was going to say, it's all good. Between, right. The background is split between healthcare, IT, and finance primarily. Um, really interesting pattern of how everything looped together. I think I found a lot of enjoyment out of trying things, figuring out what works, what doesn't work, and then pivoting. And then just finding amazing people along the way to like make the journey fun, but also to learn from. Cause like you're gonna have mistakes that you make yourself, but it's way easier. We can avoid some of the mistakes of others. So now you can make new mistakes rather than repeat old ones under the sun. Absolutely, absolutely. Um no, I, I you saw I usually give a background on how I found uh the person coming on the podcast. So I'll just do that shortly. Um so I actually came across a TikTok video of you and it was a very, very catchy, like uh, you know, first three seconds, right? Uh it's just like here's how I like failed in acquiring a business or something like that. And I, and you know, I was in the process as we spoke of acquiring a business. And so yep. I was like, Oh, okay, you know, I just failed too. So <laughs> let yeah. me uh let me see what happened with him. And that's kind of how I got introduced to you. This video was kind of blowing up on TikTok. I clicked on your page. Um, just a little quick shout out to you. You got 15,000 uh followers on TikTok. Good job with that. Um, and then I was like, all right, let me reach out and see, uh, you know, what he's about and, and stuff like that. And then for the audience, we had a, a you know, 30 minute call um, last week, I want to say, um, yeah. just to get to know each other, what we do and how we can help each other. And I was like, yeah, man, you got to definitely come up on the podcast. So I'm excited to talk to you. Um, and, and yeah, this is going to be amazing. So let's go ahead and start from where are you from? And, and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. tell me that journey. Yeah, yeah, so uh, based in Atlanta, family immigrated from Kenya a handful of years uh, before I was born. My dad's an engineer by trade and my mom's a teacher. Uh, stayed pretty much 20 minutes outside of Atlanta and came downtown to do undergrad and eventually like graduate school. Started my first business, which was business and finance consulting when I was 21. And then uh, kind of kept steamrolling into doing other stuff. Met a lot of people that are interested in like getting funding to do like real estate. And then eventually after helping a lot of people get funding, I was like, what kind of deals are you into? Then eventually like partnering in with people to do like real estate deals, to do flips, to do some vertical developments, like to learn about like Section 8 and Airbnb. And then after that, like just continue to steamroll and get into more and more stuff. Cause it's like, when you're good at like whatever it is and you meet like other people that are great at whatever it is they do, you figure out really, and actually one thing we talked about heavily here, you find great operators and you partner up and you, if you're good at raising capital, you raise capital and like place the deal, understand what you're getting into, understand exactly what you're doing. Always, I always believe in having more money of mine in any deal than anyone else's and then learning as you go and managing expectations. What do you mean more money of yours in every deal? Yeah, so like even for example, when I got started in Turo, I already had two cars and then I went to go buy three other cars, right? And then I ended up buying a fourth car like maybe a week or two like after that. I literally posted on my Instagram story because I saw, I think I'm forgetting what kind of car it was, but I saw some Mercedes like, hmm, like anyone who want to get into Turo? And then a handful of uh, people that I knew like slid up. One was a travel nurse. One is a serial entrepreneur. got like restaurants and a whole bunch of other stuff going on. And the other one was an engineer buddy of mine that I actually played basketball with as well. And everyone was like, yeah, let's do it. So then we got on a call, discussed like what was going to make sense. I was like, I'm going to go ahead and like PG through myself and my businesses, like all the different cars. And then let's go ahead and set aside six months of like all reserves to the side and then operate and get it going. So that's how I got started in Turo. And a lot of that came from like, all right, cool. Like, Everyone's, they're placing their capital to like give that buffer room, but like it's my name, my credit, my businesses that would be online if like, you know, we defaulted. So what was their profit share and did they bring any money into the table? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the six months of reserve. So we looked oh, at like okay. all expenses. Yeah, six months of reserve of like all the car payments and also like a handful of times in case we had to do um, claims and the actual um, deductibles that we would have to pay as well. And then okay. now like we, we stay completely in and the plan is just to exit. It's easy to kind of like plan it from even if you purchase a car that was more expensive, so long as you have gap, normally it works out. Either the cars will go until they pay themselves completely off, or they're getting an accident and then gap will cover the difference. And you've already been collecting cash flow month to month from the cars on Turo. Yep. What uh what did they get uh profit share based on the on the months and like what what kind of was that versus we keep what every, your profit share? Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, no, we keep everything in the business. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Cause no, no one it... was doing this to live off of, or no one was doing it. It was more so like, if you start out small, like you learn it, you understand it, then it's really easy to like start scaling and doing other stuff. Like even like doing property management for other people as well. Cause I had so much stuff systematized. And so now you can build up and scale and like add more and more with peace. And it's just about not having your hands in too many pots so you can uh, do it all well. <laughs> no, yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I, I agree. I think uh, all my partnerships, I think we even discussed this, like, I don't touch any of the money. Like we don't touch any of the money. Like, uh, for example, one of my Airbnbs in Austin right now, um, we just let it sit for 15 months. Right. And now yeah. it's sat for 15 months. Um, our lease renewal is coming up, uh, at the end of this month. And then I'm, f I'm flying down in two weeks to set up another Airbnb, like, and have it nice. just kind of snowball. Right. And so yeah. I, I, I like try and try and tell a lot of people that when I'm like consulting them or whatever about like, uh, try not to immediately live off of your, your, uh, side Eventually, endeavors, yeah, right? Business, yeah. Like yeah, 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 you got, yeah. you gotta let it build and build capital and build reserves. And then you can kind of have fun with it. A lot of people don't yeah. understand it. They get in and they see TikTok and they're like, Oh my God. Right. Like I can make this much money in this short of, amount of time so right yeah. and a lot of people talk about revenue they don't talk about profit that's the other issue so it's easy to talk yeah. about making two million dollars but like how much of that did you keep because like tickets yeah. like an e-commerce company your margins could be five percent ten percent fifty percent you don't know For what sure. that is so when someone's saying oh like i got a two million dollar business there's so much more like in it like but you learn it by but doing i'm four it. million so dollars in debt yeah. <laughs> yeah, <man. laughs> like, yeah correct like yeah with, with a terrible interest rate so my debt service coverage is trash like yeah yeah, yeah ex yep. exactly for sure man um all right so let, let's just go a quick list if you want to hit quick hitters of everything you do so we got airbnb tarot uh business consulting uh real estate what else we got uh, so on the real estate side, um, doing developments and also flips. So same thing, like partnering with people that have done it like bigger than you prior. So first development deal I got into is for a single family build for 400,000. And I'm on the cap table now for another eight multifamily build for a little over $8 million in Atlanta um, as well. And so one of the things with that one is like you pay to play. So it's very different when you're asking people about a business versus like, or like any type of deal versus being on the cap table, but just like the capital table, right? You have money invested into the deal to like, make it work. And now you really get to see the inners of like how everything really works. Um, outside of that, work at CFO for what's about to be the largest tech conference in the United States. Come our conference coming on later on this month called Render ATL. So if you're in the software engineering space, if you're full end back end, full stack engineering, we definitely got a lot of cool stuff for you and a lot of dope stuff going on around Atlanta. And then I'm super big on like community service. Uh, I have a nonprofit that I get to pull money from my own deals. And then also like some of the guys I'm with here, and we're all big on like giving back. So outside of just giving money and like doing scholarships, not only here, but overseas, also about like giving back time. So I love every single Thursday, unless I'm traveling, I'm at the same high school, like with the kids talking about life, talking about like ways to better ourselves. It's not always about finance, but I think people forget like, no one cares about what you have to say until they realize you care about them. So yeah, business is a means to an end for philanthropy, yeah. No one cares about what you have to say until you care about them. I like so that. they know you, so they know you care and they have yeah. to really like feel that so yeah yeah how do you connect with the kids because uh i don't know what age if it's middle school but there's some brats right high school. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> high school high school high school high school all right all right for sure. <laughs> like yeah but uh how, how do you how do you connect with with high schoolers you know like because yeah. i mean even in high school you got like freshman sophomore right they come yeah. in and they're not worried about business like i was never yeah. worried about business i wanted to be an yeah. nba player right so <laughs> yeah 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 yeah, yeah. I, yeah tell me about I, it. I think a part of that is just like not only like authentic dialogue but like i'm not going in there trying to preach to them like what to do as far as business but more so like how to live a happy fulfilled life no matter like what that means to them one of the first homework assignments that i gave them was that because we have primarily um we have one senior two juniors and, but the bulk majority of the group of around 30 something is freshmen and sophomores right so i had them do an exercise where they had to go home and write out three paragraphs of what a successful life looked for them when they graduated high school when they turned 25, when they, you know, whenever, the, whatever age they wanted to get married and then what retirement looks like. And now they can start like framing and modeling, like, and that's going to change. That's the same thing I was telling them. Like, it's way easier to revise a plan if you're used to writing plans. Right. Yeah. So whatever you decide you're going to be doing right now, you're 14, like that's going to change. What I thought I was going to do at 14, what I thought I was going to be doing when I was 20 versus like 23, all of these things consistently shift. However, it's just about figuring out like what works for you, 
trying stuff. And then when the kids are like, cool, I want to learn about like engineering, like, but the way our network and stuff is set up between myself and other mentors, we can grab engineers. Okay, cool. I want to play professional football. All right, cool. I know an NFL player. I'll get them to come in and like talk to you guys about what their journey actually was and what that looked like. And so that's the piece of like kind of breaking the barrier of like, oh, dang, like I want to do this. I want to do that. Let's bring you someone that can give you real life spiel. Cause it's kind of hard. Like even when people are like, oh, like you shouldn't get into business. You shouldn't do business. It's like, what's your expertise? Like, how do you, what are you saying from experience? If you're speaking from a point of experience and things didn't work out, take anything with a grain of salt, but I can listen to that better than someone that's just looking at it. Like, I think business is too risky, but like, I've never tried it. I think Airbnb is too risky to do in a state other than I live in, but like, I've never tried it. Talk to someone that has. Yeah, yeah absolutely. No, I, I, uh, I think that like not business is not for everyone, but I think everyone needs to understand business because it mm. drives the economy, right? Just mm. like, like everyone needs to understand money. Why? Because yeah. it drives the economy. So, um, yeah. I think understanding business, at least how it operates is essential for everyone, even if they don't want to be an entrepreneur. Right. Yeah. And so when yeah. I go to these classrooms as well, um, and, and speak and do presentations, I think one of like the very first things I did to introduce myself to the class was, Hey, here's what I know. What do you want to learn? And I gave them five yeah. topics and I let them choose. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Topics included everything from like Airbnb, business credit, uh, notary, yeah. just everything. And they yeah. chose business credit. And I was like, what? That's crazy. <laughs> I was like, I was thinking yeah. they were going to be like, oh, we want to know how to Airbnb, right? Or something like that. Yeah. But um, yeah. I was very impressed. And then we get there and it's just cool to see like young people, uh, you know, freshmen, sophomores asking questions. Like I had, I had a lot of people come up to me after that very first day with that specific class um, come yeah. up to me and was like, uh, hey, like I started this business. I'd love to, your advice. Right. And then, but one of the cool businesses was like this, this guy, he was a senior. He was trying to do like a movie theater. He was trying to bring movie theaters back yeah. and do like an outdoor one. Right. Yeah. Where people could pull up in the cars. And I was like, that's sick. You cool. You yeah. cool. No, <laughs> that's smart. Much lower overhead. <laughs> yeah. It, it, feel, it feels good though. That like, yeah. there's people, you know, like me, yeah. I, man, in high school, I literally was only basketball, basketball, basketball. Yeah. And maybe a little bit of girls, <laughs> right? <laughs> but uh, that's funny, man. But no, I, I heartily agree. I think that's the most beautiful thing is like just going in there and being authentic with them about like what's going on and then just giving them like real life scenarios. Because I think we one of the conversations we had was like likelihood of success, right? And a lot of people preach about like business or what kind of business like they should be getting into. But then like you really need to look at some of the numbers of like, what percentage of people succeed? And then what do I need to do to get access to those people that do succeed, right? Yeah. Because otherwise it's a bunch of people that are just talking, but like, you gotta be willing to open up the books. Like, cool, all right, you say you're making $5,000 a month on Airbnb, pull it up, let's let's show it. Like, let's talk about it. Like, all right, you wanna learn like how to, like, let's pull it up so you can look at the numbers and understand, all right, this card did the best. And like, this is what happened. Like, this is what went wrong. This is what went right. And then it's like, it's very different than like, trying to point at a whiteboard and be like, yeah, I made this much, I did this much. It's like, trust but verify. And I would say if anyone's really interested in getting into like any aspect of like business, like trust but verify. And there's nothing wrong. If someone's afraid to like open up the books and show you, I mean, I'm not saying like go to a network event and immediately be like, yeah, like what's your net worth? And like how much an assets do you have X, Y, and Z? But yeah, like yeah. once you build some rapport and like sit down like in an intimate setting or you're about to be coached by someone or pay someone like just for a little bit of time, like verify whatever they're saying. Bro, perfect, perfect like segue because I was just about to bring up how you literally responded to someone on TikTok with receipts. Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so for the audience listening, uh, Philip had made a video talking about the business deal that fell apart, right? And they were like, yeah. someone commented, it was just like, I can't He's remember verbatim. He's yeah, he was just talking. talking. About He's like, he ain't showing no proof. Yeah, he like... ain't showing no proof. And so Philip <laughs> came back. He put he did this with the papers <laughs> like this. <laughs> Came back <It's> like... <laughs> and then showed the proof of like the LOI, the yep. business uh statement, the business and, accounts that were opened up. Yep. Yeah, everything. Yep. And I was just like emails that, and it's just like that's hilarious. That's hilarious. Um, yeah, so just... <laughs> good job for that. But yeah, it, it do be yeah. some people like that though. And oh, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. honestly, it should be some people like that because. Mm. Because yeah, yeah. like I like we talked about, you'll get people on TikTok that come and just talk, 
and they probably have no experience. They're making $5,000, but they're losing 7,000. Right. And so yeah. they're not telling the full truth. So honestly, yeah. I'm not mad at the guy and yeah. I honestly respected both of how yeah. you guys handled that situation. I would yeah. love to see him come back and comment and say, Oh, I'm sorry, man. Thank you. Uh, he, like, he, didn't say, he, didn't say, he didn't say nothing. And it was funny. Yeah. People come, they were like, uh, like, one person had responded. You're like, you don't, you don't know who like video, like you're actually commenting on. Cause it's like, yeah. look at all the other stuff. Like I love talking about like what goes wrong and like what's actually there. Cause it's like, yeah, yeah trust but verify. So I was like, Hey, like I get it, man. And now I just, you know, hope you rebuttal and we can have a back and forth conversation. A little bit. Yeah. No, nah, I love <laughs> it. I, I love good banter, but um, no, yeah. before we move on, I do want to, you, yeah. you mentioned uh, this $8 million deal. I want to kind of break it down just a little bit, if you don't mind um, possibly mm -hmm. sharing a little bit of numbers, but this yeah. $8 million uh, deal. Uh Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, my, uh, I think I accidentally just uh, <laughs> a black. I screen. I put my uh, screen in saver mode. Anyways, this okay. eight million dollar deal. How many investors you got? Uh, so I'm one of the investors on the table, and this is one of the things when you're getting into different types of projects. Like you want to co-invest with people that have a great track record of doing it, right? The developer that I got into this deal with because of another board that I sit on and another investor that I know. Uh, long story short, has done everything up to like a hundred units at a time and had at least like five really big deals that were done. And so it makes it easy, like even, even here, like I'm not gonna, you know, name drop uh, who's doing what, but a good buddy of mine just finished crossing over having like 100 AUM and like multifamily real estate, right? Which sounds like crazy, but his methodology is even the aspect of, I don't need, I can own 100% of like something small or a small percent of something huge, right? So who are the people you get to partner up to do it? So I'm one of eight investors on the capital table uh, for that project. And I syndicated, meaning that like, I put some of my own money then I also pulled money from other investors that I work with. And then there were seven other investors that all put money into the deal. And then there's also some bank financing. I'm not going to, I don't know. I don't want to breach NDA, so I'm not going to say specific numbers, but everything is going pretty well for the houses already done. Seven of them are going to be done over the next uh, two months, roughly. And then hopefully they'll all be sold by the end of this year. And that project broke ground in December of 2021. Oh, so you guys are flipping it. You're not keeping it? Uh, built to sell. So yeah, built to sell. Well, yeah. Why Why not hold it long term? Uh, they're luxury builds, right? So I think one of the other things that really sucked is like in COVID, like construction costs and engineers were allowed to swing things around and uh, basically charge you a rate in their price. So even the cost of the project went up over a million dollars. And I think the whole point for investors in a lot of cases, they want to get in, make money, like get out because with, I think luxury units like that, I mean, they can cash flow depending on what you're going to do, but all the investors were pitched on, this is built to sell. So that's why we got into it. And that's why we did it. And then now this also helps me build my track record as I go on to like the next project, as I do the next capital raise, because one other thing is like deal flow and like access, right? Yeah. Majority of the people that are on the cap table for that deal are like 50 plus. And that's another thing that's pretty fun. Like when you're younger doing it, a lot of people are willing to invest. If you're like 50 something saying like you're doing some of these things and there's nothing wrong with it and everyone has their own path, but it's a lot easier when people are like, okay, cool. Like what have you actually done? Like, what do you have access to? Like what kind of deals do you do? And do you actually understand like the numbers? Are you just getting money and throwing in stuff that you don't understand? Or can you really talk through the deals? And by yeah. being inside of those things, you really get to learn a lot more. Cause even yeah. the first house that I did, the, the developer that I work with had me, this one's a way bigger project. So like I'm way more hands off with the first one. I'm going back and forth with the city, doing a bunch of stuff, even with like flips I've done. Like I'm doing a lot of project management as well as asset management. And you learn so much uh, just by controlling the deal. But then eventually you learn, uh, you want to delegate to operators because if you have someone, and actually I was having a conversation about this yesterday. If you're only spending, this is the challenge my friend made to me because I, I like having my hands in different stuff. If you're spending less than five hours a week learning something new, don't study it. Unless like maybe like you're first getting like started, but if you already started niche down and you got like really good at something because you have people like one of my friends here has a whole team of folks that work over eight hours a day, just doing a few things that like someone's trying to learn an hour at a time, two hours at a time. Yeah. So really it becomes what's my best use of time. What's the best way I can add value and then make money in the process instead of feeling like I got to learn everything. I got to do everything because it's impossible. You know, there's not enough hours in a day. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. No. Um, want to talk about, um, you mentioned that you brought in money and, uh, you syndicated some, I don't know if yeah. it's breaking the NDA. Do you mind sharing how much money you brought in? Uh, yeah, yeah no, 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 I don't mind. I don't mind at all, man. Yeah. I put uh, 40,000 in the deal. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Nice. Uh, and then, um, the other one was, uh, oh, uh, do you prefer, 
uh, you you mentioned it. Do you prefer when you like own a small piece of a big big thing or a hundred percent of a small thing? So I've been doing a hundred percent of small things. Like when I was first getting started, this is my first like smaller piece of a much bigger thing. Okay. And honestly, like this is going to be the pathway to a lot of other things, even when it comes to like ac- business acquisitions, right? Like, yeah, you can have, you can syndicate out money just with, for those that don't know, like syndication just means like you then go and pitch other investors to put money together to go and like buy an asset, whatever that thing may be. Right. Yep. And so I'd much rather have a small percentage of a billion dollar company than have a hundred percent of a million dollar company, right? More than 1% because then it'd be the same thing. So at least like 1.5 <laughs> or above. And then that well, makes yeah, sense. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I got you. I got you. Um, yeah. <laughs> are you are you kind of the numbers guy or do you guys have someone that's the number guy at your, your cap table? Finance with Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my whole other tag. <laughs> what was was math your thing in high school? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. I've always loved math and science uh, a whole bunch, so it's always been one of my favorite things to do. Um, and then my dad, me and my dad used to always like play little games with stuff as far as like math. So we gamified it and made it like really, really fun. Hated literature and social studies. I actually, when I <laughs> when I used to be in a in school in elementary school and even like middle or high, like I would read like either summaries. I'm like, what was it? Spark notes? Spark notes used to be the yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, I'd yeah, read yeah. like the beginning of the chapter and the end of the chapter. And then I would just like talk and like, you can eloquently like describe a few things. You can get around like most things in general, which is why it's dangerous yeah. on places like TikTok because people can fluff like the yeah. beginning and the end, but then they can't really talk to proof in the middle. But yeah, you well, can't I think yeah. I think statues of uh, limitations is up, so I can now confess that I did the same thing with Spark because I hated <laughs> I hated reading. So <laughs> I love it now, but it's like I didn't I didn't have access to read what I wanted to read. Same, like, same. I what that was. Yeah. Same, same, same. It's funny how that switches. Like the older you get, you're yeah. like, I really like what I didn't like before. Like I like I like yeah. tomatoes now. Like yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean, yeah. but. Heck yeah, um, instead of just ketchup. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I actually, I actually hate ketchup now. <laughs> um, let's go ahead and talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about each business. What was your biggest mistake in Tarot? Obviously, we made a lot of mistakes, but which one hit home to you most? Well, I, I think if I knew what I knew now, I would have done fleet insurance a lot sooner because then I would have been saving over like what were the numbers? Two, two, three. I probably would have been saving around like five to six hundred dollars a month. Uh, yes. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. We had, we had rented out a gym to, to utilize this. Let me pick up my bag. We're going to walk and talk as yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> we discuss yeah. it. Uh, but yeah, it was probably not doing fleet insurance, which you can get once you have, and there's my bag, which you can get fleet insurance <clears throat> once you have five or more vehicles. But now you also have some companies like Lula. Well, with Lula, you can pay about $79 and you get access to private rental insurance and one-on-one insurance. Uh, if you're doing stuff through ride sharing apps such as Turo as well. Lula, L U L A. Yeah. Huh? Nice, nice. Okay. Um, cool. Oh, I like that. I kind of like that flooring on there. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. They had a they had a pretty neat space. The lady was telling me like, "Hey, look, it's time to go." I was like, "Whoops, yeah. we can definitely nah. do that." But it's funny. That's how we I, make things shake. I, I like I like the I like the vlog style. I've been doing more uh, <laughs> live in person vlogs, so this is kind of like a little, you know. <laughs> A little hybrid, <laughs> um, for yeah. sure. So, um, yeah, fleet, fleet insurance for sure. Fleet insurance for sure. Yeah, I I agree. I I downsize. I used to have like five or six cars. Now I only have two because I'm trying to like exit that that area mm. or at least uh, decrease, not exit. But um, yeah. and so, have you thought about doing subject two for a younger investor that's interested in getting into Turo? Uh, here's the thing, is man, like I gotta be honest, like for me. Turo numbers don't make sense for new people. Mm, Yeah. So I can coach someone on Turo. I can do all that. But it's very dependent on where you're located and obviously the car. And just for uh, with the interest rates and everything, the numbers don't make sense in my book right now. Like I bought these cars five years ago. You know what I mean? Yeah. (laughs) No, I wholeheartedly agree. And that's why I was like, maybe like the aspect of subject two. So say you have a vehicle that has a super low interest rate, like personally, right? And now this young person is going to get in. They're young. They don't necessarily have as much money. And they're like, oh, snap. Like if I go and try to rent on a car, like I'm only going to be able to get a super high interest rate of like 10, 12%, et cetera. But you still have your loan, right? 
and you tell them, hey, look, like I'm going to take this down payment and maybe like have collateral for two months of everything that I need cash flow wise of so the payments. I don't know, a thousand bucks. Then it's like, I need $3,000 for you. So I have three months of buffer in case you default or don't do something right Yeah. now. They can be like, all right, cool. Now they can go and rent. I'm assuming like this would be like a high end vehicle. So maybe like a Range Rover, like yeah. a certain type of Porsche, Tesla, whatever the heck. And now they can take your interest rate that you have. And then they're like, all right, cool. Like I actually have room to go and do that because it's the cost of capital and the cost of debt is going to make all of the difference on whether the business can actually be successful. Yeah. Okay. No, I agree. I agree. Some yeah. of my guys. <laughs> <laughs> my my yeah. business partner, uh, uh, he actually does like subject to now uh, for yeah. like students and stuff. So he's so, no longer purchasing cars. He just will have people throw their car up on his platform because he yeah. has the reviews. He has the automated system, right? And stuff yeah. like that. So he's doing it. But I don't know. For me, I'd rather do it in other, like I'd rather do it in Airbnb or yeah. I, I really want to get like own property. So that's like my goal right now. I've learned yeah. that if I'm dipping into too many things that like, I just, it, they grow slower. Right. Yeah. And so I'm trying to really like dive into, to, um, two things, real estate or business acquisitions and yeah. building my, uh, notary agency. Um, nice. and so, um, yeah. but yeah, I agree. <laughs> Let's talk about your biggest mistake with Turo. I mean, uh, Airbnb, Airbnb. Oh, biggest mistake with Airbnb. I don't want to call it a mistake, but I will say something I would have done differently. I probably would have gotten more mortgages because um, I started off doing arbitrage and I had other partners and then we started buying houses and then started downsizing because in Atlanta, they said they were going to be enacting a short-term rental ordinance. And with this ordinance, they were going to limit that you could only have two Airbnbs. And that scared me. And I don't want to get caught having five different payments. I think altogether it was like a little over like 11 grand a month, like between everything. So I shut the other stuff down just because I was like, man, like, I don't want to get caught with all these other things. And they were saying like 4,000 rental units in Atlanta were going to be like shut down altogether because of the ordinance. And I was like, that's just not where I want to be at. But what if it, they were all just properties, I could have easily went over to like doing midterm rentals or doing like section eight. So it wasn't a mistake. It's just something that I would have done differently because of how much money was like put down and just like rent, even though like some houses have equity and stuff like that. I would have just done like pure houses, maybe done some subject to or owner financing if I knew like what I knew now. So I wouldn't call a mistake. Airbnb, honestly, like I automated a lot of that relatively fast and made it like a really great time. So I would have themed, you know what? I would have themed. That's the only thing I would have said yeah, I would have did yeah. differently. I would have themed my Airbnbs rather than just make them nice. But like, uh, yeah, you always just need a, a good designer or like a woman's touch in some of those places and they can look a lot better, which luckily one of my business partners, his girlfriend loved doing all that stuff. So we're just like, and even like my sister, another friend of mine is like, Here's the money. Like, go, go, go yeah. make it however you think it's going to look really pretty. <laughs> yeah. Now, nah, I'm flying my wife down in two weeks to Austin yeah. so she can do that. <laughs> 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 Doesn't look like a bachelor pad. So, um, nice. but uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I think I'm at a space. I, it's, it's a, it's like a, it's an irony statement, but um, I like, am in the process of wanting to purchase more homes and get mortgages yeah. yet yeah. i'm going to set up in in <laughs> uh a rental arbitrage you know in in two yeah. weeks so yeah. um if the numbers but, make sense they make sense so like yeah. one way or another like there's no right or wrong it's like depending on the market depending on if you have money to actually fix when things go wrong because like in um, one of the houses that i have in atlanta we had water pipes burst after um the end of winter like last year and Dude, my, my godmom's in Atlanta and hers burst like literally every year. Like insurance is like tired of her shit. Oh, dang. Like, uh, yeah. yeah. She might need to change what kind of pipes they got. She got a bad plumber. If, uh, they keep putting ones in and they get it burst. Or I guess I, they're like, we're going to keep getting work. It's they're like, times. we're going to keep getting work. I hope she's yeah. not contracting the same people. <laughs> Man, nah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Like it, it burst. And then like, of course, like with all of the different businesses and residential places that were like down in Atlanta, like finding people to do it was like, I, I want to say like it would be like quote unquote hard, but luckily after like a couple of phone calls to bigger investors that I knew, I had someone to come over and like get this stuff done. But even like the renovation check that they cut, uh, the insurance company cut was like twenty one grand and spent about it was like twenty eight and some change, like getting everything done. So it's like if you're not in a position to eat that, like because you, you can go back after supplements and stuff. But like once insurance pays you once, like it's a real pain in the butt to get it otherwise. But like yeah. you got to have the eight k to go ahead and disperse. 
to get the property back ready, to put it back on Airbnb, to make it back. We use like midterm rentals and like also um, short term rentals for that particular property. And it's like, do what you need to do. But yeah, stuff like that is like the other side of ownership. Something like that happens somewhere you're renting. You don't have to worry about dealing with any of that. So it could be like, hey, look, I want to go the safety route of like if I can make a thousand dollars for each of these like consistently and then I scale up 10 of them, that's 10,000 a month. Like who, who's going to be angry at $10,000 a month if you can do it safely and smartly and with the right people? Yeah, facts. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to the hella misguided segment where I ask the same yeah. question to each entrepreneur and business owner that comes up here. That question yeah. is, if you were to write a letter to your 18 year old self, what would a summary of that letter say? Good luck. Have fun. I wouldn't give myself any type of advice of anything because honestly, I have enjoyed like all of the rights and wrongs of like my different story. Like I wasn't planning on doing business. Like I was planning on going to school and becoming a physician. I worked in in hospitals for a couple of years between programs like overseas in the Dominican Republic and in Greece. I worked in pharmacy for five years in the in the U.S. primarily in Atlanta. So I wanted to learn pharmacology and have a leg up for medical school. Then I ended up changing majors from bio. To you got like health. hella lives. Um, How old are you for the audience? For the audience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm 27. So yeah, yeah you yeah, li yeah. you lived like a 40 year old already. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So it's like you get to go and like experience. You get to live in another country. You get to see like how the other side is like, if you never lived without AC, I'm not saying like, you know, everyone has their own circumstances, but like if you can go and serve and live in a community and like really walk besides people and like, it gives you so much gratitude for like how you also approach life and like how you also approach like your problems and realizing that pretty much anything <laughs> is possible. So that's the reason like, I wouldn't tell myself to do anything because like every screw up in every moment put me exactly where I am right now, right here with you, right here with all the amazing people like that I'm with. So I wouldn't change a thing because then even that one micro decision of saying like, I don't know, like <laughs> go buy Bitcoin or like who's gonna win in the Super Bowl? Like go ahead and just bet this money and like get this obscene amount. Like the path would be so different, and I I wouldn't do anything differently. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I know, think I, you... I could tell something to someone else my age, but I wouldn't tell it to myself. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I see. I see. <laughs> All right, let's talk about that business failure that you, yeah. you know, I, I found the TikTok of you yeah. explaining. Go ahead and explain it for the audience why you failed to purchase it in a sense. What happened? Yeah, yeah. Um, long story short, the deal just fell apart as far as like the numbers and due diligence. So, like, we once you have like proof of funds, like you can now put in an LOI and then people open up the books. Like, once they open up the books, you can see everything that's there. Uh, the bank that was financing deals started seeing like everything that was there. And there was a couple of discrepancies and that was enough for them to be like, no, because also we're in a now time where like people are getting a lot tighter with how money is. I, I don't know how many investors like you're dealing with, but even a lot of investors like are not looking to place capital, like doing a bunch of stuff right now, unless um, they're safely like getting things done. So the same thing with banks, like they're going to now start being a little more reserved with like how stuff actually is. So I think that's part of it. There's always a lot of different ways to do it. And actually it's funny. Another buddy of mine here has a pretty dope podcast where he brings on like a lot of entrepreneurs that like do different stuff. And one of the guys that came on was talking about how he owner financed an $8 million business that was like cash flowing positively. And I was like, yo, like that's awesome. Me and him ended up like, I asked him some questions in like the panel segment. Then I hit him up on LinkedIn. I was literally, that's actually a cheat code. Most people don't just actually like reach out and lead with value. So that's gonna mean like people don't wanna have conversation. You gotta figure out like how to initially give rather than hit someone up and then immediately say like, yo, like <laughs> teach me something, like give me something. like. Put me on like your podcast. I see you have a platform. Like, but when yeah. people reach out to you because they see how you give value, something's yeah. always there. So I, I hit him up on LinkedIn and was like, hey, look, like I look around your your Instagram and like your social media and other stuff. Like, you know, I'm wondering like if you have people on your team that do X, Y, or Z, like I've helped strategize and do some stuff with this. And then like yep. I want to see anything that can help. So he's like, Oh, cool. Like, you know, we got on a call. So we got on a call and essentially he's like, Yo, like I actually like don't need help with like any of that stuff and then we started talking about <laughs> my first deal we started talking about his acquisitions that he was working on and just life i was in florida for an event that we were doing with amazon with the tech conference and he was like oh man like too bad like you're there today like i'm actually going to be in town for a company i'm looking to buy in a couple of days we could have gotten dinner and i was like what day is dinner <laughs> and then so literally went right back to atlanta and then flew back a couple of days later just to go and hang out with him for the day have dinner spent like seven hours talking about like life business and like collaborating so it's like you can lead and find your way to do it because to me one since i also travel hack i didn't pay anything for my flight i used my marriott pass so that i can have a discount rate i stayed on south beach for like 70 bucks like before taxes and stuff instead of 300 and then paid for an uber to go like back and forth 
ate at the Sky Mount at the Sky Lounge when I got there, <laughs> and then also like ate in Atlanta, then ate when I got back. So I was held over until dinner. So I ended up spending less than three hundred dollars, like all throughout that entire trip. But like, imagine how much you got to pay to sit down in front of someone that knows how to acquisition an eight million dollar business, completely sell their finance and value add to it. Yeah. People can charge ten, twenty, thirty k just to sit down for less. So yeah. now you have to figure out like, don't play about the price. So if all it meant like I need to move around my schedule so that like I can get there, I got to figure out like how to add a value to you so that you actually want to meet me there and you're like looking forward to sitting down with me. Like that would be like my challenge. You find someone who's doing awesome stuff that you want to learn like what to do with it. Figure out how to add value before you approach them about, you know, like, how can you help me? Like, everybody wants to learn from the people that are doing cool stuff at the end of the day. And eventually, like, they understand, like, their time is valuable. And there's nothing worse than saying, like, oh, like, I'd love to pick your brain or, like, I'd love to get coffee or, like, take you out to dinner. Because all that means is, like, I want your time for free. And if that person is intentional about how they spend their time, they're going to be guarded. Unless they're, like, for me, that's why I do stuff like Free Finance Fridays. I'm like, cool, I'm going to allocate this time to help people for free that aligns with my schedule. But I can't do backflips to meet someone randomly just because they're interested in talking to me. But I create the space so that random people can come and talk to me. So it's like I still make myself accessible, but like I honor my boundaries and values of all the other things that I have going on. Because otherwise I'll be running around like with a chicken with my head cut off. Yeah. Every time I got a random DM about like, yo, like, I love to talk. I love to do this. Like, you think someone's reached success, like can't buy their own lunch. Right. It'd be more, you'd actually get a lot farther. Be like, I'd love to pay you $500 just to sit down and talk to you. I guarantee you in a lot of cases, they'll be like, no, don't even worry about it. Like I'll give you my time for free just because I see that you value my time. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. Yeah. yeah. No, that's good. Well said. Well said. Uh, You did mention travel hacks and I did see your video uh, explaining that exact uh, trip. So um, I want to talk about that. What are, cause I'm, I'm, I've been looking right now to even get some uh, credit cards for traveling as well. My wife loves to travel and she's very bougie. So (laughs) um, (laughs) I've been looking, you know, ways to save money. So go ahead and list your credit cards or your top travel hacks right now. All of it. Um, All of the cards would be entirely too many for me to like keep up but i will favorite, say my favorite favorites. one for traveling favorites would be the platinum delta american express card it's 250 250 a year right and the thing that i think is dope with that is the aspect of you get your bag checked in for free which round trip that's 60 bucks right so if you're traveling five times a year 300 dollars like knocked out off rip another thing is like the aspect you get a companion pass every year that's valued up to 500 bucks so what does that mean i'm like yo look like i'm coming to your city to la And I have another meeting with an investor in Seattle. I'm sure you'd love to meet. I got to do those trips anyways, right? So I'm going to book my flight to Seattle, you know, from LA. And now I pay for my ticket and then your ticket is free. It's like, Um, now you can just split the cost. You can split the cost of the one ticket and now you save a couple hundred bucks. off. Southwest used to have that. Um, What's the like requirements to get that companion pass? Is there any, Um, do you have to do anything? Nope, it gives it to you for free every single year. So now you get your bag checked for free. And you can do one free domestic trip with another friend like once a year. And then if you're traveling, yeah, if you're traveling like a decent amount, then I would say like the Amex Platinum card just because of the access to like all the different lounges that you have. Um, And then you can end up like eating for free. That's the one thing I like. If if anyone's ever gone to an airport, eating is going to cost you 30 bucks easily just for one person because they upcharge the mess out of the food. But now it's like I can go and eat if you're someone that drinks, like you can go to the bar and have like complimentary drinks as well. Yeah. You can, and also meet other people that are doing really dope stuff because, you know, for the most part, you have to have a certain type of income and a certain type of credit score to get access to those lounges anyways. So, yeah, it, it's like a two way play. You get to eat for free, you get to save money, you get to meet super interesting people as well. Like I got to have a conversation uh, with Evander Holyfield when I was heading to the Bahamas a couple of years ago because he was in the Sky Lounge in Atlanta after they had um, put a statue in Atlanta. And so, like, we just got to sit down and, like, talk about, like, life and, like, a bunch of different stuff. It's just like approach people like they're people, right? Wait, what the like, hell? That's so yeah. weird. Like, what'd you guys talk about? <laughs> what? Would, how? Wait, who? Who said the first word? Who said the first word? <laughs> oh, I can't believe like, people were like running up, like doing whatever. He had a seat to his next to him, so like <laughs> sat down, and, like turned. And, nice. like, we just started like talking about life, and I, and there's a couple things that like I'll always like stick with. One of them was he talked about from working like 50 hour weeks and making like eight grand over the course of a year to now making like 250k like in a night in a fight and then getting like 20 million like in a night in a fight what was was he doing before what was he he doing professional boxer no before before that before that 
We, you uh, said, oh, before you he said, was at the Sky Lounge? Oh, they had just put up a statue of him in Atlanta. No, no. You said something about making, Uh, you said working 50 oh, 8, hours. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. $8,000 for the entire year. Like, that's how much he was making before, like, he started professionally, like, fighting. Wow. And then from going from that to making, like, yeah. 250K in a night is, like, that's a that's a pretty far CB. Like, he called his mom and she couldn't even fathom it. But the other two things that I would say that were, like, really beautiful, he talked about, like, the path and the process and how, like, as you continue like picking like what you're going to do and like how you want to like scale, you normally try to find other people to buddy up with. Right. And he said like, as you guys, um, <laughs> as some other guys that he was with, they moved out and they were training for the Olympics. And he was like, first guy moved his girlfriend in and then he stopped like waking up like as early. The second guy moved another girlfriend in, stopped waking up as early. So when it came down to like compete, like they couldn't compete on the same level. Right. And so it's like, you gotta be mindful of the people that are around you and the distractions. Cause that just might be like, they were, and gonna enjoy creating a family a lot more than like going to the Olympics and like everyone has their own path. But yeah. for him, like he wanted to be a champion. So it's like, it was gonna be different. Second thing that I'll say like was super freaking awesome. I was like, you know, like you made a bunch of money, you've traveled a bunch of places. Like what's the most beautiful place like that you've seen? And he was like, man, at some point you just get to a point that you appreciate all of God's creations on earth. And I was like, mm. and I was like, I love it. So now, yeah. Even when people are like, oh, like, because I love sunsets and, and uh, I love droning and stuff as well. And so people are like, oh, you know, like, what's the favorite place to eat? And it's just like, yo, like, I just appreciate all of God's creations in the world. That's that's going to be like uh, your your book title or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's dope. Please, please tell me you didn't bring up the Mike Tyson thing. Oh, no, I did not. I, I'm sure. I'm sure he hates that by now. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I didn't, I did not bring up the bike because I wanted to like, have you yeah. to enjoy the conversation. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I want to press that button, and I'm sure like <laughs> it's in an interview. I'm guaranteed like if I googled it, and I never googled that. I know someone asked him that in an interview at some point. Yeah, yeah. And it's more like perspective of like life, what matters, and like what things are. I feel like you learn so much about how people do their day to day business and what actually motivates them when you ask them more questions about life. Right? And just like how much money do you make? How to make a bunch of money? Rather than like, what's your philosophy <laughs> on a happy life? What's your philosophy on a balanced life? How do you feel yeah. about family? How do you cultivate relationships? Do you actually maintain your friendships? Did you build up with the people that were beside you? I like that. For, yeah, it's like so much more that it gives you real perspective of like, you see how much someone's making, what they're doing, what they're driving, what they have, whatever. But it's like, what does the back end of their life actually look like? Yeah. Is it really enjoyable or is it just like smokes and mirrors, right? Yeah, facts, facts. Uh, a yeah. couple more questions and I'll, I'll let you get back to your day. Um, cool. Where do you see yourself in seven years? So 2030. 2030, honestly, I, I'm I'm looking forward to, to being married, uh, probably having a little one like running around. I, I think the the highest honor of like things to do in life isn't like net worth or like cash flow goals, which are still important, but it's uh, actually to be a father and like actually being able to like pour in and like build another life. So I'm gonna keep doing exactly what I'm doing alongside amazing other people, which it doesn't make you like too big to fail, but it sure makes it a hell of a lot harder when you have the right people beside you, keeping accountable, being authentic with like what your goals are, where you are, what you're struggling with, what you need help with. Um, it makes it really hard to lose, to be completely honest. <laughs> yeah, no, having a family definitely changes you and it, it changes your risk tolerance. Like you yeah. can be so yeah. risky right now being single, like you could lose right. it all right. tomorrow, right. rebuild it. Like right. I can't do yeah. that, right? And, yeah, and yeah. part of that is because it's like, all right, I put myself in this position to be, you know, the dad, right? And yeah. I also know how how it feels to not have a dad, right? Mm. Or to have a dad yeah. who's too busy working all the time, yeah. right? Yeah. And so uh, I, I told myself growing up, like, I never want to be that. Obviously, yeah. you got to work. If you if you, you got to yeah. work to to provide, but there's certain yeah. boundaries, right? Um, yeah. And What's I'm still up, learning. Man? I still make yeah. mistakes, and and I yeah. think that's okay. Um, yeah. But yeah, um, what is your biggest fear? Honestly, like the way that I look at fear is like very different. And I'll tell you a story about uh, my fear of heights and, and what I did with it. Right, uh, always had you know somewhat of a fear of heights, and the same thing with like failure. Like you just learn to have like better relationships with how things are. So the first time I wanted to go skydiving was like my freshman year of college. And all of the friends that I gathered together to do it, it was like six of us. Everyone backed out either days prior or the days like leading up to it. Cause I was like, if I skydive, like I can really like look my fear like dead in the eye and then say like, you know what, I'm gonna do it anyways, right? And that's exactly what happened. I ended up driving two hours like by myself and then like looking at it and be like, am I gonna go do this? And I was like, heck yeah, I'm gonna go do this. And I've done it like multiple times like after that. So I think fear is a very rational and logical thing that keeps us safe 
that's why it's like maybe you don't like go run into traffic because like not only because you're scared but because like your risk tolerance and it might not necessarily make sense yeah. but i think when it's fear about something you don't understand normally you need to figure out a way to find someone that understands it a little bit more if you'd like to go that route or you literally need to go look at it dead in the face and be like i am terrified of what may happen and i'm at peace with that and i'm gonna do it anyways so yeah. that's kind of like how i look at fear so there's nothing else man honestly they say don't spend any time thinking about things that are inevitable and one of the things that's inevitable is the fact that we're gonna die so i don't know when that day is i don't know when my ticket's gonna get punched and I might as well enjoy each and every day while I have breath to give and something to be grateful about. I like it. I like it. You're a very positive guy, man. I don't know how you <laughs> how you are like that, <laughs> but that's good. That's great. You know what I mean? <laughs> funny, funny story about skydiving is um, yeah. I wanted to skydive before I met my wife, uh, mm -hmm. like like maybe a year and a half ago or a year and a half before I met her. I was looking yeah. into it to do it for like my birthday or something. I was going to invite like some friends or something and I'm looking yeah. into it. And my birthday isn't there yet, so I didn't book. A month okay. goes by, and on the news in my area, someone died from that same sky, sky, uh, skydiving place. And mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, I'm never doing that. It was literally the same place I was looking at. Then you go back into their history because the news did all the investigation and stuff. And yeah. there was like, like a lot of people that died within like seven years from that place. I was like, oh my God, I could have died. <laughs> but but like we, we can we can always die because like what's the number true. one like way that people die is like driving a car, but it doesn't stop yeah. us from getting in the car and going somewhere, right? Facts. But you're way more likely to die driving on a day-to-day -day basis Facts. than getting out of a plane. But I can feel you, it's like that since having just that it's that like I final get it, destination. I get it. I get it. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The one question I asked when I was going up uh, skydiving the first time I was like, is everything okay at home? Like you want to make it down to the yeah. bottom, right? And the guy was like, "Yeah." I was like, "All right, let's do this." Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, for sure. I would probably still do it if I had if I didn't have kids. Now, now that I have kids, I'm like, ah, I don't, whatever. I, 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 I'm I cool. Do. I'm cool. I fly. I fly planes. I'll do that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. If, have you ever done um, pilot school? Like you do your first hour of pilot school for like two, three hundred bucks, and then like you actually really? get to fly a plane. It is a exhilarating experience to say the least. That's crazy. No, I, I'll look yeah. into it. Um, I, I want to do the right. The, we we live next to a, a really popular race car track, Sonoma, like race car, like NASCAR is coming next month. And yeah. uh, and they allow you to like rent the cars out there and just. Oh, snap. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to do one of those, especially because my, my kid, my son loves uh, cars. So nice. Um, Heck yeah. yeah. Nah, nah, nah. I love that. <laughs> we got to do an event with uh, Susan G. Coleman a couple years ago at Atlanta Motor Speedway. And like oh, you're okay. only supposed to go like 40 miles per hour, but there was like a, a Corvette C8. And I think it was a Tesla X that was like in the back with me. And then so we kind of like lagged like on the laps. <laughs> and then yeah. we were just like gun it and like yeah. circle around. <laughs> but it's weird because like you're driving and you literally feel like you're sideways. But like that's what it's about. Like that's what like the experiences, right? Like yeah. the experiences of life. And even like aligning that with like, yo, like I love, I know my son loves that. That's something that I would love to do. So I'm gonna like align those two things together and have a great time doing it. Facts. Experience yeah, is life. I love that. Right. Um, okay. We are going to wrap it up. The way I like to wrap it up is with a segment called Guided Conclusions. It's a question yeah. I asked that we didn't talk about uh, previous to pressing play. That question yeah. could be serious. It could be funny. It could be sad and make you cry. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> All right. Where yeah. do you find yourself struggling with the most? And, and you could kind of account this blame to the reason yeah. you're not at where you are where everyone would hope right like okay yes you could be happy about life and where you're at and stuff but obviously <laughs> it's like hey damn i wish i was in this position right now right like yeah. that's just that's just human nature so what do you struggle with most that is keeping you from being in that position at right now at 27 I struggle with being scatterbrained, like, and ah, like scatter, scatter, yeah. it's like, oh, like not necessarily like shiny new dress. It's like, also when you understand like how to do like a few things, it's like, you can be good at a lot of stuff, but like, what are you going to be great at? And you can be, still be great with like a few things, but it's like, I like to say I have a really large eyes and a medium sized stomach. And so it's like being able to make sure I have enough stuff on my plate that what's there. But, but honestly, like, I don't look at it like where else, like I'm supposed to be. Cause I, I always look at it like this, like depression comes from like living in the past and anxiety comes from living in the future. And the only way to have like peace is being with peace with like self with where we are right here. So I make sure that I'm always at peace with like where I am right here, no matter what it is. Cause the only thing I can control is myself and my ideologies, my vision, like 
how I look at the universe and the world around me and interact with people. Cause I'm consistently like, like, I know, like I'm supposed to be here. Like I'm supposed to be this. It's like, I, I don't necessarily think that like, there's this gigantic destiny of like what we're destined to do. I think a lot of things are like random chaos and I'll swing back around like why I actually think that part of that is I think that works when you have a redemptive story, but like most people don't have redemptive stories. Right. If we look at like, if you lived in other countries and like done other things and like, talk about sad and like cry, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to that place, right? Um, I got to work and do some stuff in the DR, uh, working in like hospitals and like nonprofits. And you know, DR is a place that's really big for like sex tourism, both for adults and for children, right? And while talking with one of the mothers that was there in the community, cause you have unemployment rates of like 60% or higher. And she talked about how, because of being so hungry and being in like such a distressed situation, which is very real, it logically made sense to sell her four-year-old child to eat. And I don't think that that child deserved, or there was like just destiny, like you were destined to be born into that situation and then die. I think there's a lot of randomness when it comes to life. And I'm just grateful like that I haven't had to encounter like that in my own like childhood. And what can I do to like make life better for other people? So it's easy to always talk about, oh, like people should spend their money doing this or people should spend their money doing that. So it's like, put up or shut up. Like I make sure I spend my time and I spend my money to like, aligned with those same values. Like one of the kids that we've been supporting like overseas, like, and it literally costs $500 a semester. So $1,500 a year puts him through school with like boarding food and all that stuff. And now he's gonna graduate high school. $1,500 later, the kind of money that people can waste on like dang near anything, but I'm not here to tell anyone how to spend money. That's just the kind of stuff that like gives me fulfillment. So that's what I spend yeah. my time doing. Yeah, That's what's up, man. You, you said something really, really good, but you kind of glossed over it. And I want you to just say it again, but very slowly for the camera. All right. Cause that was just amazing. Yeah. It was the um, depression is focused on the past and anxiety is yeah. on the future. Yeah. Say that one more yeah. time. Cause that was, yeah, just... yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, depression comes from living in the past and anxiety comes from living in the future. So the best way that I find life is to find peace in my right here and right now. <sighs> That's crazy. Where did you, did you come up with that? Where'd you learn that? Where'd you hear that from? What... I, I've read a lot of philosophical stuff and love philosophical conversations because I sure. think, uh, the one thing we should do is like question things. Like that's yeah. what life is about. Like figuring out what it means for you. Like what's your path? What's your thing going to be like? That's one of the dopest things about being like misguided and really like being misguided is okay. Like you don't have to have everything figured out. Exactly. Everything doesn't need to be teed up on a silver platter. Like, but can you find peace in what you're actually doing? And if you don't find peace in that, what do you need to do to change it? And what can you do to like control yourself as you move forward through it? Because you can't exactly. control anyone else. No, I agree, man. Uh, dude, this is probably one of my best interviews. And I have some I've had some really good interviews, but I really like this because I think we we are on the same level philosophically. Like yeah. everything you kind of said is like I, I've already thought, right? And so yeah. um I appreciate your time today, Philip. Man, this has been amazing. I appreciate the the real life vlog of you walking <laughs> and everything, the the breaky <laughs> internet connection. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, um, it's my pleasure, brother. <laughs> for, for sure, man. Man, go ahead and drop uh, your where everyone can follow you and stuff, all your social media. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, uh, you can find me on Instagram at philip.carayas. So that's spelled P-H-I-L-L-I-P dot K-A-R-A-Y-A or on TikTok at Finance with Phil. It's the same thing on Instagram and you'll see like collaboration posts, but I post, I'm working on that now, but posting way more on my on my main page. But yeah, super excited to have conversations. Come to Free Finance Fridays. I do different topics and we'll discuss stuff on Turo, Airbnb, capital raises, travel hacking, and it's literally free on a Friday. You just got to make sure it'll, it's lined up with my actual calendar. So it's like once a month, find a time that it makes sense with you. Come in and ask questions. I don't go through PowerPoints. I literally wait to see who's in the audience. And I say, what do you want to talk about? So yeah. Oh yeah. And I got a financial literacy app. So you can go on the app store and actually download Finance with Phil and then shoot me a DM. I'll give you free access. Just say that you found me on this podcast. Well, I thought you were going to give the misguided free access. Ooh, Ooh. 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 I dropped that in there. <laughs> <laughs> we can do that. We can do that. We can do that. <laughs> you can get you can give the, the audience a code too. That's what that's what uh most of the people who, who have apps do is they'll give like a code for them to sign up for a discount. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can definitely I can create a special link. Just remind me, I'll put that link in my bio and then whenever this goes live, I'll I'll make sure that it's in there in my link tree. For sure, for sure, man. Hey, you gotta yeah. use up uh, with Koji. 
Shout out to with, with Koji. It's way better okay. than Link Tree. I'll, I'll tell you why. But um, appreciate okay. you for coming up here, yeah. man. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Again, this is the Misguided Podcast, where we intend to guide you to a better future. My name is Juwan. I'm sitting here with Philip. Make sure you guys go uh, follow Finance with Phil, and we'll see you on the other side. Have a great day, everybody.